The following is an encore presentation of the Weird Darkness Radio Show. One hundred fifty years ago, Jacob Cooley ordered his African American slave, Hosea, to build a chest for his first child. Hosea set to work, crafting a wooden chest of some remark. For some unknown reason, his master was displeased with his efforts and beat his slave to a pulp, killing him. Cooley's other slaves vowed to avenge the death of their friend and sprinkled the dried blood of an owl in the chest and had a conjure man curse the chest. As if by magic, Cooley's firstborn died in infancy, and over the forthcoming years, a total of 17 deaths were attributed to the conjure chest. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness Radio, where every week you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up this hour… In Tuscaloosa, Alabama, there was a home built by slaves that is considered the most haunted in Alabama. Drivers are reporting strange, ghostly orbs following them on dark roads. We'll look at a few haunted roads and spook lights. But first, the brutal death of an African slave brings a curse upon the wooden chest he was ordered to construct. We begin with that story. If you're new here, welcome to the show. If you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen in with you. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to visit WeirdDarkness.com where you can follow me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, and more. That's WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. An elegant mahogany veneer chest of drawers, hand-carved by an African-American slave 150 years ago, resides in the Kentucky Historic Museum at Frankfurt. Crafted in the Empire style, the chest has glass knobs on its four drawers. Nothing about its outward appearance gives any hint that tragedy has stalked its existence, that it's known to historians as the conjured chest. Two decades before the Civil War, the family of one Jacob Cooley lived a sumptuous life as wealthy Southern planters. Jacob owned many slaves and farmed thousands of acres. He was also an evil, despicable man who frequently beat his slaves for the slightest infraction of his stringent rules. Jacob Cooley ordered one of his slaves, an excellent furniture maker named Hosea, to construct a chest that would be used for his firstborn child. For some unknown reason, Jacob was angered at Hosea's finished product and beat him so savagely he died a few days later. Cooley's slaves, led by an old conjure man, placed a curse on the chest for all future generations. One drawer was sprinkled with dried owl's blood and a conjure chant was sung. All those associated with the chest would fall within the curse's evil power. Although Jacob Cooley himself evidently escaped the malevolence, his descendants were not as fortunate. The baby for whom the chest was originally built died soon after birth. The chest was in his nursery. His brother inherited the chest, and he was stabbed to death by his personal servant. Jacob Cooley had another son, John who inherited one of his father's many plantations. The young man led a serene bachelor's life until a vivacious young woman, barely out of her teens, came into his life. Her name was Ellie, and she soon married John nearly three times her age. The couple inherited the conjured chest. 
Knowing of the tragedies that had befallen her husband's siblings, she put the chest in an attic. Meanwhile, Jacob Cooley's youngest daughter, Melinda, eloped with a waggish Irishman named Sean. With nowhere to live, Melinda turned to Ellie. John and Ellie had done well and had accumulated several farms in Tennessee. They turned over one of these to Sean and Melinda to work. While Melinda bore her young husband a brood of children and worked from sunrise to sunset, Sean came to loathe the dullness of farm life. Ellie Cooley tried to help, but Sean's rebuffs made her presence unwelcome. To try and bring some beauty into Melinda's dreary existence, Ellie sent over her father-in-law's chest. It had been in her attic for a very long time and nothing had happened. She'd almost forgotten the chest's legacy. Perhaps the curse was only a lot of talk. Within days, Sean deserted his wife for the bright lights of New Orleans. Melinda was inconsolable. She took to her bed with an ailment. There, Melinda soon died, an exhausted, gray-haired woman barely out of her thirties. Shortly after his wife's death, Sean was struck in the head by a steamboat's gangplank and died. The conjure chest had claimed its third and fourth victims. The couple left many orphaned children. John Cooley was given the job of traveling to Tennessee to assign the youngsters to other family members. The youngest, a baby named Evelyn, ran up to him, her tiny arms outstretched. John took her to live with his own family in Kentucky. Little Evelyn grew into a beautiful and intelligent young woman. When she turned 16, Evelyn passed an examination that provided her with a teaching certificate, with which she took over a one-room schoolhouse. She met and married a Scotsman, Malcolm Johnson, barely two months after she began teaching. As a wedding present, Ellie presented her niece with Jacob Cooley's handsome chest, and the evil passed to a new generation. Evelyn Johnson had children and even adopted a young orphan, a girl named Arabella. The curse was all but forgotten. Evelyn had the chest but didn't find it necessary to use right away. However, after Arabella married some years later, Evelyn put the girl's bridal gown in the chest. Shortly thereafter, Arabella's husband suddenly died. That was the beginning of a series of horrible events visited upon Evelyn and Ellie. Arabella's child died after her baby clothes had been put in the chest. Evelyn's daughter-in-law, Esther, married to her oldest son, put her wedding attire in the chest. She died. Evelyn's Aunt Sarah knitted a scarf and gloves to give to her son for Christmas. While walking along a train trestle, he fell off and was killed a few days before Christmas two other tragedies befell Evelyn's immediate family. A son-in-law deserted his wife and a child was crippled for life in a bizarre accident. Yet Evelyn's husband, Malcolm, was a success. A small man, always courteous to those around him, he parlayed a shrewd Scottish sense of thrift into a burgeoning business empire that, at its height, consisted of mills, houses, a coal yard, wharf, and a dry goods store. Malcolm was an extraordinarily wealthy man when he died. Despite her material comfort, his wife was haunted by the memories of those around her who were struck down or stricken in some other way by hardship. She took her own life. Eleven persons. The conjure chest was taking its toll. As the 20th century unfolded, the chest was inherited by Virginia Carey Hudson from her grandmother Evelyn Johnson. Mrs. Hudson thought tales of the curse were just hearsay. She was wrong. Her first baby's clothes were put into the chest. She died. Another child's clothes were tucked in a drawer, and she contacted infantile paralysis. Another daughter's wedding dress was stored there, and her first husband ran off. A son was stabbed in the hand. He had clothes in the chest. A friend of the family put hunting clothes in it, he was shot in a hunting accident. And so it went. Sixteen victims, all of whom had one thing in common. Some of their personal clothing had been put in the conjure chest. 
Mrs. Hudson wanted to put an end to the curse. She found what she had hoped would be the solution in the form of an old friend of hers, an African-American woman named Annie. Annie understood curses and conjures. The spell cast by Hosea's faithful companions would be broken only when three conditions were met. First, Mrs. Hudson would have to be given a dead owl without her having to ask for one. Second, the green leaves of a willow tree had to be boiled from sun up to sun down. The dead owl had to remain in sight. Third, the boiled liquid was then to be buried in a jug with its handle facing east toward the rising sun, below a flowering bush. A stuffed owl given to Mrs. Hudson's son by a friend accomplished the first requirement. Mrs. Hudson plucked leaves from a nearby willow tree and boiled them in a large black pot. The owl kept watch from a kitchen counter. At dusk, old Annie and Mrs. Hudson took the jug and, with its handle pointed east, buried it beneath a flowering lilac bush outside the kitchen window. Annie said they would only know if the curse had been broken if one of them died before the first full days of fall. Annie died in early September, the 17th and last known victim. The final private owner of the conjure chest was Mrs. Hudson's daughter, Virginia C. Maine. Though she may have been skeptical of the curse and knew fully the story of the curse being lifted by Annie and her mother, she never stored anything in the chest and kept it hidden in her attic. The Kentucky History Museum has it now. Mrs. Maine donated it to the museum in 1976. According to museum registrar Mike Hudson, the chest is in storage in our vaults, awaiting the time when it fits into a new exhibit. Supposedly, the curse has been removed. But has it? Tucked safely in the top chest drawer is an envelope with a cluster of owl feathers inside. The museum isn't taking any chances. Up next, in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, there is a house built by slaves that is considered the most haunted in Alabama. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises, but those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your close-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have because he's not human. Bigfoot loves our country and you, so much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does, so he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past – absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts, I'd like to recommend the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There I have gathered numerous free resources to help you fight depression, including the Crisis Text Line, the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, Save.org, iFred, and more. These resources are absolutely free, they're there when you need them, anytime, 
24-7 on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash hope. On 17th Street in Tuscaloosa, there is a home that is hailed as the most haunted in the state of Alabama. It is called the Drish House, which was formerly known as Monroe Place. Built mostly by slaves for John Drish and his wife on a plot of 450 acres, it was a beautiful home, styled in both the Greek and Italian Renaissance style. However, as beautiful as it was, darkness from its past marred its beauty. The owner, John Drish, already had a sad, morbid history when the house was built. He was a doctor and was married to a woman named Catherine Washington. They had a daughter named Catherine. Sadly, his wife died when their daughter was young. He sent her to live in Virginia with relatives because he believed living with a widower would not be good for her. John Drish was allegedly a charming man, and it didn't take long for him to woo and marry a rich widow by the name of Sarah Owen in 1825. He brought his daughter Catherine back to Alabama to live with him, but their relationship was frayed, so much so that a story of cruelty surrounds them. Allegedly, Catherine fell in love with a man John didn't approve of. He locked her in her room with very little food and water, and she eventually relented. She later married only to bring her sons back to the Drish house. She had divorced their father. Many rumors suggest that Catherine suffered from mental illness. Though charming, John Drish was an alcoholic, and he suffered from a violent temper. Sadly, John Drish would die because of that. There are three stories surrounding his death. The first is he threw himself from a second-floor balcony. The second is that he was drunk and fell down the stairs. And the third story alleges that he was trying to stop drinking and began to shake from withdrawals and fell. Regardless of which story is true, John Drish died in 1867, leaving his distraught wife to plan his funeral. Sarah was so distraught that she became more and more eccentric. She planned an elaborate funeral. When it was over, she kept her husband's funeral candles and hid them away. She insisted that they be burned at her funeral. When she died in 1884, no one could find the candles so her wishes were not met. Sadly, these were not the only dark things to surround the Drish family. Dr. Drish's niece was murdered by her husband, and there was also a rumor that a runaway slave hid in one of the towers, but when he exited because he needed food, he was returned to his owner who burned him alive. There have been reports of a male ghost who is assumed to be this slave. Since Sarah's death, the house has been used as a school, a church, salvage yard, an auto parts store, and was also reportedly a prison during the Civil War. Besides the male ghost, ghost lights have also been reported near the top of the house and what appears to be a ghostly fire shooting from the third-story tower. Of course, there is no fire when the firemen arrive. This occurrence is either blamed on the ghost of the slave or Sarah Drish, who is believed to be angry because her wishes of using her husband's funeral candles at her own funeral were not met. Though the house fell in disrepair for a while, it has been restored and it's now open for those who wish to hold events there. So there is hope that the dark history of the Drish house is gone and can now have a bright future. In a society known for its superstitions, A property agency faced an unusual challenge when tasked with selling an alleged haunted house in Klang, Malaysia. To reassure potential customers, they took a unique approach, seeking the help of a paranormal research team. Brandon Grimes from Paranormality Magazine tells us about it. The property in question was rumored to have a dark history, with claims that the previous owner had tragically taken their own life. Keen on dispelling these rumors and certifying the property's safety, the property agency hired a paranormal research team whose investigation garnered significant attention on the KL Salongor Lalong Properties Facebook page. 
on the specified date and time of observation, May 30, 2023, from 9 p.m. to midnight, the dedicated team diligently explored the property, searching for any signs of ghostly activities. Their findings were encouraging, as they revealed no major indications of paranormal occurrences. They attributed the flickering lights to faulty cables, the door's movement to the wind, and the eerie sounds to wildlife in the vicinity. Intrigued by the team's assessment, netizens had a good-natured laugh, thanking them for confirming the absence of major ghostly activities while jokingly speculating about the possibility of minor ghostly activities. However, some curious netizens offered amusing suggestions to the research team. Some humorously recommended extending the observation period until 3 a.m., citing Chinese beliefs about heightened negative energy during that time. Another proposed an even longer investigation of 15 consecutive nights rather than days. Despite the lighthearted banter, the property's value remained significant, with a market worth of $2.4 million in their currency auctioned off at $1.4 million. Situated in a gated community with access to exclusive clubhouse facilities, the property possessed alluring features for potential buyers. While the haunted house might have once discouraged buyers, the intervention of the paranormal research team managed to dispel some fears. Ultimately, it seems that superstitions and beliefs still hold a place in Malaysian society, but thanks to creative solutions, selling even the spookiest properties can become a spirited affair, leaving netizens open to the idea of an extra companion in a large home. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. Have you seen the Monster Channel? It has horror hosts, B-horror movies, retro television commercials, and a whole lot more, and you can watch it anytime, absolutely free, 24-7, 365, on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. Just go to WeirdDarknessTV.com. That's WeirdDarknessTV.com. Roads have always seemed to attract about them tales of the strange and unusual. They push out further and further ahead of us, their destinations not visible, mysterious as the landscape rushes by us, sometimes bringing with it bizarreness. It is perhaps this almost primal sense of oddness that has spawned countless tales of haunted roads, inhabited by all manner of strange entities and apparitions. One feature of some spooky haunted roads are ghost lights, also called spook lights, dancing and twirling in the dark to baffle and amaze, and sometimes they seem to be far from harmless. Some malevolent spook lights seem to be linked to some sort of phantom motorists, and perhaps one of the more well-known of these is said to prowl a rural road in the town of Switzerland in St. John's County, Florida in the United States. Here there is a modest little road called Greenbrier Road, which runs just east of the main town, and there have for years been tales of a rather aggressive spook light that stalks vehicles that dare to drive along here at night. 
The enigmatic light is typically said to look just like a motorcycle headlight, which will pull up behind cars and steadily catch up no matter how fast the car goes, growing even larger in the rearview mirrors of the startled drivers. The light of the Greenbrier Road will then either chase the car until it is gone or bizarrely perch itself atop the vehicle, sort of piggybacking the car for some distance before blinking out of existence, as if it were never there at all. In some cases, the mysterious light has even been blamed for causing crashes alongside this lonely stretch of road. The most common origin story for this mysterious light is that it is the wraith of a doomed motorcyclist who died along the road when he was decapitated after running into a telephone pole wire and that he now terrorizes the stretch upon which he met his fate, with only the headlight of his phantom bike visible. One witness named Todd M. gave his story to the Weird U.S. website, saying, A few years ago, I went to see Greenbrier Road at night with three of my friends. We had heard the stories about that light that people see and we wanted to see it. We drove up and down the road for like 40 minutes trying to see something but never saw anything until we got ready to leave. My friend Tom was driving and he looked in the rearview mirror and said, What's that? He looked behind us and there was the headlight of a motorcycle coming up fast. We slowed down a little and thought the biker would pass us, but then, just as it got right behind us about a hundred feet, the light went out. There was no motorcycle or anything. We turned around and went back but didn't see anything. I really think we saw a ghost biker of that guy that was killed on his motorcycle on that road. The malignant Greenbrier ghost light is so well known in the area that it has been the target of paranormal investigations and even scientific studies and police investigations trying to find a rational explanation for what people are seeing, but no explanation has ever been found. Speaking of phantom motorcyclists, there is another similar spook said to haunt a remote stretch of road winding through the rural farming county of Exeter in Tulare County, California, which is supposedly the stomping ground of a similar ghost. In this case, in the 1950s, a group of friends allegedly decided to play a prank on one of their friends by stretching out some rope across a narrow road called Bardsley Road in the Fresno Valley, after which they lied in wait for their motorcycle-riding pal to come cruising by on his way home from work. The plan was for the rope to just hit him in the chest and knock him off his bike, which was pretty mean, but they didn't intend to seriously hurt him, certainly not kill him. The story goes that the rider came along the darkened road, as expected, and also hit the rope just as expected. What wasn't expected was that the rope would be too high and lop his head clean off to go rolling across the pavement. In the aftermath of the gruesome accident, people started occasionally claiming to see a bright light shooting up and down the road, sometimes accompanied by the sound of a motorcycle engine and with the full apparition of a headless rider visible as well. Motorists and people walking along the road at night have also told of being followed or even chased by the phantom motorcyclist, and it's believed that if you encounter the rider, you will be cursed to be in an accident yourself. Adding to these, is a headless rider said to prowl Creek Road of Ojai, California, apparently riding a vintage 1940s motorcycle and appearing as a glowing light at first, often pulling right up next to motorists to bang on their vehicles or chase them. Interestingly, Creek Road is ground zero for all manner of ghostly phenomena and high strangeness, including at least two phantom horse riders, numerous apparitions, a smoking, horribly burned and disfigured entity called the Char Man, and even a supposed vampire, making a headless motorcycle rider actually one of the less bizarre tales from this place. Other sinister spook lights seem to be malevolent spirits or even possibly demons. Located out just northeast of Jacksonville, Florida, is St. George Island, which is home to a historic sugarcane cotton, and corn plantation from the slave days called Kingsley Plantation, 
established by a man named Zephaniah Kingsley in 1813. The original plantation would quickly grow until Kingsley owned around a total of 32,000 acres of land and employed about 200 slaves. Despite having so many slaves, Kingsley was known for being a very lax and kind slave master, allowing his workforce to basically do whatever they wanted when they were off duty and they were allowed to sell any crafts they made on their own time. Kingsley even married one of his slaves, Anna Magajean Jai, who would go on to take a prominent management role on the plantation, own her own land, and end up being one of the richest women in the state. Although conditions were much better for slaves on the Kingsley Plantation than they were elsewhere, there was some amount of tragedy on the plantation nevertheless. At some point, one of the slaves allegedly took to beating and raping other female slaves, even, according to the stories, murdering a few and hiding their bodies in the wilderness. When the other slaves got wind of this grim behavior, they are said to have gathered up a lynch mob to hunt the perpetrator down and had him strung up and hanged on a massive, spooky-looking oak tree right in front of the plantation along the main road to the premises, leaving his lifeless body to swing there in the wind. Although Kingsley would move to Haiti along with all of his slaves in 1837, it seems that at least some of them remained, in a macabre sense. Over the years, the Kingsley Plantation has come to gather quite a reputation for being intensely haunted, supposedly by the ghosts of those murdered here. One is a woman in white that is frequently spotted roaming around and has a habit of photobombing pictures taken at the locale while another is an unearthly screaming or wailing that supposedly emanates from the old abandoned well on the property, said to be from a victim of the crime spree whose body was unceremoniously dumped down there in the darkness. However, one of the most frightening of the spirits of the old Kingsley Plantation is supposedly the vindictive spirit of the mad slave murderer himself who terrorizes the plantation's creepy and rugged, unpaved road. This particularly malicious spirit typically takes the form of two malevolent, angry-looking red lights said to be his glowing eyes, earning the phantom the name Old Red Eyes. These lights will supposedly appear right behind cars, right about at the old oak tree, and chase them, in some reports even relentlessly attacking them. One report of an encounter with old red eyes was described by a witness thus. I saw old red eyes several years ago. I have a friend that lives just off of that road and had taken him home from Jacksonville one night. It was about midnight and after dropping him off, I was driving back down that road to the hard road and looked in the side mirror on my car and saw two red lights. At first, I thought it was the taillights of another car, but they were too close together. I slowed down a little and watched them in the mirror, and it looked like they were coming closer. I knew that I had not passed another car, and it did not seem like a car would be coming down that dark road backwards. I stopped and stuck my head out the window and looked back, and there was nothing there. Then I looked in the mirror again, and there they were, and they were right behind my car. I gunned it and got the hell out of there. What I saw wasn't a car." Just as ominous is the appropriately named Demon's Road in Huntsville, Texas, which is already spooky enough, as it meanders through groves of twisted trees and darkened woods and ends up at the desolate Martha's Chapel Cemetery. The real name is Bowden Road, but it has earned its nickname in the decidedly frightening phenomena that have been reported from there, such as shadow people a ghostly child with glowing eyes on a tricycle, a hulking, faceless beast, a strange hooded figure, and arms reaching out from graves. There are many spirits said to lurk along the murky stretches of this road and in the cemetery, but one of the creepiest is a ghost light that seems to be quite malicious indeed. Motorists venturing down the Demon's Road have often reported mysterious red lights hovering about in the dark, the number of which seem to depend on how many people are in the vehicle at the time. 
These spook lights will supposedly aggressively pursue cars and, spookiest of all, will leave unexplained handprints on the outside. Indeed, these lights have plagued many who have traveled down the road, often leaving those handprints and always hostile, sometimes even clawing or grabbing at cars to leave scratches and dents behind. What could this diabolical force be, and why does it want to attack vehicles? Nobody knows. More haunted roads and ghostly lights when Weird Darkness returns. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. Another case in Texas of an aggressive ghost light is that said to roam a road in Hardin County, leading from Bragg to Saratoga, which actually at one point was a part of the Santa Fe Railroad back in the early 1900s, before being paved over to be turned into a road. In an area called Big Thicket, there have long been reports of a multicolored spook light hovering about at night along the road and in the surrounding wilderness, with many of them pointing at the light being quite evil. Even from the beginning, the reports of the Big Thicket Ghost Light, also called the Saratoga Ghost Light, were far from friendly. Hunters reported being chased by the lights, and it was not uncommon to hear of them rushing amongst horses to send the animals into a panicked frenzy, to the point that on at least one occasion, a horse-drawn wagon was forced to go crashing into a ditch because of the lights. At the time, the lights became a pretty widespread rumor, attracting all sorts of curiosity seekers, and author F. E. Abernathy would explain the phenomenon in his book Tales from the Big Thicket thus. Light seers poured onto the road by the hundreds. People of all ages and intellects came to see and test their beliefs in the supernatural. They shot at it, they chased it, and they tested it with litmus paper and Geiger counters. A preacher harangued the road's multitudes from the top of his car, making the light as an ill omen of the world's impending doom. There were some nights the light didn't show at all, but for the most part it was there to inspire stories that could be passed on, to change and grow at the will and imagination of the storyteller. In later years, the light did not stop its antics in the slightest bit, with reports of it chasing people or even attacking them common, such as cases in which the light stopped car engines, burned people's hands, or even violently knocked them down. There have been reports of cars being dinged, dented, or smashed by the ghost light, and it is generally not something one wants to encounter while driving down the already eerie rural road. As usual, there have been many attempts to rationally explain the big thicket light, such as that it is some sort of illusion, swamp gas, or merely headlights, and there have been a fair number of more paranormal explanations as well, 
including that it is the spirit of a hunter or Civil War soldier, or even that it is a curse placed over a lost Spanish treasure. Whatever the case may be, the stories of the evil ghost light of Saratoga persist. Texas seems to be a haven for such spook lights because there is another road in this state that has its own scary stories of such entities. In the area of Mitchell Flat, east of Marfa, Texas, there have long been reports of mystery lights floating out over the desert landscape since at least the 1800s. The phenomena are usually described as dancing orbs of light that zip and zoom low to the ground over the parched desert scrub, and they have collectively been coined the Marfa Lights. While the phenomenon is puzzling but usually harmless and distant, there have been some reports that show these lights can be rather frightening on occasion. In one report from Weir, Texas, one man named Tim Stevens gave an account of a very bizarre experience, witnessed by a friend of his father's named Roy while traveling down Route 90 in the 1970s. According to the report, Roy had been driving for hours out from San Antonio after sunset and just before dark, and there had been no other cars out in this remote stretch of the highway that evening. Suddenly, he noticed what he took to be headlights in his rearview mirror. For some time, the lights remained a comfortable distance away, but at some point the lights quickly closed the distance to follow right behind him. The report explained the following sequence of events. My dad said that Roy had been driving up with the lights a comfortable distance behind him for several minutes when the vehicle sped up and approached his truck rapidly. For a few seconds, he honestly thought he was about to be rear-ended. Before an impact occurred, however, the light stopped a few feet short of hitting his truck. At 60 miles per hour, in the middle of an otherwise deserted highway, it probably wasn't too much to ask for a courtesy of a little breathing room. So Roy tapped the brakes. The driver of the vehicle behind him maintained his distance. Roy again tapped his brakes. No response. Finally, very annoyed, Roy jammed hard on his brakes for a fraction of a second. To his amazement, the vehicle behind him stayed the exact distance from his rear bumper as it had been. Roy decided to try a different approach. He said he floored the gas pedal, making his small truck shudder and lurch ahead. The speed crept up to 80 miles per hour. The lights behind him reacted in perfect unison staying several feet behind his truck as it approached speeds Roy was sure he'd never pushed it to before. At nearly 100 miles per hour, the truck was beginning to vibrate badly, but the lights did not waver. Enough was enough, Roy eased off the gas and let the truck coast down to a sane speed, then he stood on the brakes. The tires screeched and smoked, and the truck pitched and slid slightly to the side, but the whole time, Roy watched the lights in the mirror. They stayed in exactly the same spot until the truck came to a stop. Roy then saw something completely unexpected. The lights shot out off the road to the right and fired across the desert like missiles. He craned his neck around to try and follow them visually, impressed by the driver's driving on what was sure to be a very rough road. He smiled and was about to drive on when a thought occurred to him. He frowned and making sure he wasn't about to be run over by a big rig or other traffic, put his truck in reverse and slowly backed up, maybe a couple hundred feet. He checked the barbed wire fence line for a road, a gate, or other break of some kind where his pursuer may have slipped through. But there was none. Roy said he was pretty spooked, all right. Off the distance, he could see lights move swiftly across the horizon. Whatever this was, whether it was connected to the Marfa lights or not, it certainly seems hard to explain away as a trick of light or headlight reflections from the distance. Ghost lights have been a persistent phenomenon within the world of the weird, and there have been countless theories to try and explain them. Yet none seem to touch on those lights that seem to reach out from the merely mysterious to lash out at or harass those who encounter them. Is there some explanation for this, or is this just hoaxes and tall tales? If it is indeed real, 
then why do these particular spook lights cling to these locations? And why do they seem so hostile and threatening? It seems to be beyond our ability to comprehend at this point, and these lights may flit about the periphery of our understanding, prowling their haunted grounds without ever being satisfactorily explained. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please tell somebody about it who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. If you missed any part of tonight's show, or if you'd like to hear it again, you can subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast app by searching for Weird Darkness. By doing that, you'll get a copy of tonight's show, plus daily podcast episodes that come out seven days per week. And you'll also get tonight's Sudden Death Overtime content with stories I prepared but didn't have time to share. Visit WeirdDarkness.com and you can also follow me on social media, drop me an email, send me your own true paranormal story, listen to other podcasts that I host, and more. All stories used tonight are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories or the authors in the show notes, which I've already posted at WeirdDarkness.com. The Conjure Chest is for The Unexplained Mysteries. The Haunting of Drish House was written by Amanda Penn for Horror Media. Haunted Roads and Spook Lights is by Brent Swanter for Mysterious Universe. The Haunted House for Sale in Malaysia was written by Brandon Grimes for Paranormality Magazine. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 11 verse 9. With his mouth the godless destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge the righteous escape. And a final thought. If the only prayer you said in your whole life was, thank you, that would suffice. Meister Eckhart. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Terror began in January by the light of the full moon. The first scream came from the snowbound railway man who felt the werewolf's fangs ripping at his throat. The next month, there was a scream of ecstatic agony from the woman attacked in her cozy bedroom. Now, scenes of unbelievable horror unfold each time the full moon shines on the isolated main town of Tarker's Mills. No one knows who will be attacked next, but one thing is sure. When the full moon rises, a paralyzing fear sweeps through Tarker's mills, for snarls that sound like human words can be heard whining through the wind, and all around are the footprints of a monster whose hunger cannot be sated. Cycle of the Werewolf by Stephen King Hear the entire novel absolutely free on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness Radio, where every week you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up this hour… More than a hundred years ago, reports described it as the most weird and gruesome apartment in the world. Why display an entire room full of grotesque items and open it to the public? Kell's Irish Pub in Seattle has a creepy vibe to it, even if the displays and decorations inside aren't meant to be. Perhaps that's because the building started its life as a massive mortuary. Early one February morning in 1897, John Mars jumped out of bed from a sound sleep and while the smell of breakfast cooking downstairs wafted up to the second level of the house, 
he inexplicably grabbed his pistol and went on a shooting spree of his own family. But first, a four-year-old has a paranormal experience, and the man he grew into over 60 years later is still unsure of what happened to him. We begin with that story. If you're new here, welcome to the show. And if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen in with you. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. While you're listening, be sure to visit WeirdDarkness.com where you can follow me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, and more. That's WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. When this occurrence happened, I would have been about three and a half years of age, and I have never forgotten it. This would have been in 1951 or 1952. My understanding is that this particular house came as a job package with my father's employment. I can still recall some parts of the house and its general interior layout. At this time, my parents and my sister, younger than myself, we were living at 36 Canal Street, Derby. I was never brought up with bogeyman tales or other happenings to cause some fear or to obtain obedience from me. Therefore, I cannot say that such imaginings were put into my head for me to invoke an event later. Despite my young age, I can recall this particular evening and event. The house was somewhat large and it had a semi-spiral staircase, with a red-colored stair carpet on the treads and risers. At the top of this staircase was a landing, which led to the bedrooms and bathroom. For whatever reason, I always used to ask my mother to leave the curtains open, and occasionally the window partly open. It was one of these sash type of windows that opened and closed vertically. On the adjacent wall to the window was the door to the landing. This door was in the area of the foot of the bed and to the right of the bed. The side of the bed was across from this wall with the bed head on the wall behind me. There was a small table close to the head of the bed where I always had a tumbler of water, as often I would awaken overnight and have a drink of water, which continues to this day. When in bed, and before the forthcoming event happened, I sometimes would hear what I thought to be a voice of someone who was speaking very softly, something like a loud whisper. The way this voice spoke, it sounded to me as if this person was looking for someone, but in a more inquiring fashion. Sometimes I never heard this voice, but it always came back, even if eventually. There was just the one word spoke, but it was repeated. This sounded to my ears to be, Jack? Jack? These two words would stop for a short while, and then the same two words were softly repeated. Jack? Jack? This may happen three or four times, and then stop as if the person had gone away. I had no idea as to which gender the voice belonged. All of this caused me no issues whatsoever, and it certainly never frightened me. It was just there, from time to time after I went to bed. The incident which I'm about to relate I can well recall. My mother put me to bed, and as per usual, the curtains were left open and the window slightly cracked. I never heard these soft-spoken words of inquiry, and so I must have fallen asleep. Later I awoke to what sounded like two cats fighting outside. We had no pets, but there were a couple of cats that came into the small garden. And during all this screeching and wailing from these cats, there was the sound of what appeared to me as being of empty tin cans rolling, falling onto a paved surface, and then rolling along this surface. I imagined that the cats had run into such cans 
and toppled them over. All of this certainly caused me no concerns. I had a drink of water and I must have gone back to sleep. I was awoken by a lady <laughs> laughing. She was in front of the bedside table and between the edge of my bed and the wall, where the door was located, which in turn was adjacent to the window at the foot of my bed. The lady was nondescript in color, being a dark gray. However, I could see some patterns and frills on her dress. This was bell-shaped, front and back, but more so at the back, and something that would be seen in the late 1700s to early 1800s. Her hair was pulled backward and in the fashion of a bun at the back of her head. She appeared to have long sleeves on her dress that had a lace or other frill material close to the wrists. There seemed to be something like a frill or a lace collar to her dress. This lady had a bracelet on her right wrist. However, the most significant detail of this particular lady, to me, was that she was laughing, but more so by the way that she actually laughed. Her laughing was very loud and it could be best described as being in the form of what is sometimes referred to as hysterical <laughs> laughter. She had both her hands over her face and partly on her forehead while she endlessly laughed. Throughout this laughing, she was rocking forward and back up again from waist level. I do not recall if I was frightened, but even at my tender age at the time, I thought something was amiss. I left my bed and went into my parents' room, awoke them, and told them that there was a lady laughing in my room. And this is my story of the lady at 36 Canal Street, Derby. Nothing frightening, but I would love to know if something ever went awry in the history of this house long before we occupied it. Very many years later, I must have been around 17 or 18 at the time, I learned that this house had originally been built by a person that arrived in Derby from what is now Belgium. My understanding is that this person was associated with, or was, a founding member of the soft drink manufacturer Burroughs and Sturgis of Derby. That would require investigative authentication, which I have never performed. This newly learned piece of news, at that time, made me prick my ears up, as it made me think, or should I say at least consider, was the voice that I sometimes heard when in my bedroom, which caused me no alarm or other concern, not be saying Jack, Jack, but in fact, could it have been Jacques, Jacques, or even being the shortened form of Jacqueline in the French dialect? I wondered whether the person voicing Jack, Jacques, was actually looking for a Jack somewhere in the house, so calling out softly to get a response from Jack to locate that person's whereabouts. Very many years later, I learned that my parents often heard talking elsewhere in the house, and persons moving about in the house, as well as furniture being shuffled about. However, there was never any evidence on inspection or investigation of any furniture that had been moved. There were neighbors, I never knew them of course, who always had visitors and they made some noises. However, these people left and I was informed that the noises and inaudible talking within the house persisted on. My mother was somewhat concerned and rather uneasy at times about this house. Apparently my father was not so inclined. This attitude of my father may have been related to the fact that during World War II, he served in the RAF as air crew in bombers, which could be a physically and psychological terrifying experience in itself. Consequently, he had little to no fears of noises or voices emanating from elsewhere in the house. In later life, I cannot recall ever seeing or believing my father to be a fearful type of person. I recall when in this house, and whether it was pre or post my experience of the lady, my aunt, my mother's sister, visited us from Scotland. The only thing that I can recall was that my aunt, my younger sister, and myself were in the lounge room one night, 
with Radio Luxembourg playing loudly. My parents had attended some function at Nottingham, and my aunt was babysitting my sister and myself. My aunt appeared to be rather distressed, as I recall. My parents returned home, and I can recall my father being the first to enter into the lounge room. Both my parents were very surprised that my sister and I were still up and about, and also the radio playing loudly. The radio's volume was reduced, and my aunt, who was now in tears, was speaking to both my parents and all on the far side of the room. I never heard one word of this conversation. I was told, again many years later, that my aunt was very frightened on this evening as she heard talking outside the lounge room along with other noises also. The above-mentioned neighbors had since left. Therefore, to drown out these stories and voices, she had greatly increased the radio's volume and furthermore she would not venture outside this room to put my sister and myself to bed. I tried a number of times, after learning of this incident, to get my aunt to tell me her experience of that evening. She adamantly refused to talk about it, and sadly, I never found out directly from the person concerned what actually occurred. Apparently, my aunt was always very frightened and alarmed about this house after her first visit before that mentioned episode. We eventually left Derby and moved to the village of Willington, where my father originated. We lived at Willington until September 1962 when we moved to Stafford with my father's employment. Many years later, the subject of 36 Canal Street came into the conversation with one of my father's friends. My father went on to say to this friend that the person who moved in to the vacated house at 36 Canal Street, Derby, when we left for Willington, once pulled my father to one side and asked him if the house was haunted. Apparently, my father would neither confirm or deny this. This person then told my father that he and his wife had heard all manner of noises within that house, with people talking, but their conversations were imperceptible. On one occasion, late one night when he returned home from work, a lady had passed this man on the stairs. This lady said something to him, but he was very tired and unsure of what she had voiced and didn't realize this passing on the stairs until he was on the landing. Furthermore, and most interestingly, he told my father that his daughter, who was about six years of age, was very frightened in the house and that she had heard somebody calling out, Jack, Jack. Furthermore, this little girl had seen a lady laughing very loudly in her bedroom. <laughs> When Weird Darkness returns, more than a hundred years ago, reports described it as the most weird and gruesome apartment in the world. Why display an entire room full of grotesque items and open it to the public? Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. 
You can get more Weird Darkness seven days a week through the Weird Darkness podcast, which you can find wherever you listen to podcasts, on YouTube, or visit WeirdDarkness.com slash listen and you can find a list of all the apps where you can listen to the show. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash listen. In June of 1899, Newspapers across the country trumpeted the story of New York City's newest site, something so strange and macabre it would have rated the highest attention even in the heyday of P.T. Barnum. Reported first by the New York Journal and then picked up by the newswires, it was the story of a hospital room that was being decorated entirely with human bones in order to present a specter of mortality that was intended to eventually rival such morbid monuments as the Paris Catacombs or Rome's Capuchin Cemetery. The masterminds of the project were a pair of doctors, Northway Meyer and Howard Nielsen, both on staff as anatomy demonstrators at Flower Hospital at 63rd and Eastern. It would later merge with other hospitals to become the New York Medical College, and William Flater, the head nurse of the dissecting room. The trio had converted the anatomy lab into a veritable charnel house. A pyramid composed of bones from all parts of the human body, surmounted by a skull, were set on a long table as the room's centerpiece, and were flanked by skulls hollowed into drinking cups atop what the newspapers described as tripods of tibiae. Next to this was a full skeleton enthroned in a large chair with his arm resting on the table and his gaze overlooking the pile. The room also included signs lettered with toe and finger bones. These spelled out the names of Meyer and Nielsen against a black background and noted the initials of the Institute's proper name, NYHMNC, in large blocks, New York Homeopathic Medical College and Hospital. Various skulls and crossbones adorned the walls and garlands of bones had already been hung, with additional planned so that the ceiling itself would be obscured by a sea of human remains. Finally, as one newspaper account explained, up and down the walls, like ghastly white serpents, crawl coils of vertebra. Wire service reports dubbed it the most weird and gruesome apartment in the world and said that if the feeling of dread for these specimens displayed can be overcome, the display is quite enough to excite the interest and imagination of the most case-hardened sightseer. Sensational it was, but the project was also not in the least controversial. What was the point to this macabre display, or was it all simply the gratuitous fantasy of sick minds? Flater, who performed the actual labor of assembling the bones and was noted as the artist who eccentric inspiration is accountable, was quick to provide a defense. It was meant to be didactic, a kind of learning aid, he explained. Our bone room is intended to serve as a practical aid to students of anatomy, he told reporters. Human bones of every description can be found grouped about in artistic confusion, he continued, and this would allow the anatomy lecturers to quiz students in novel ways on their knowledge of the parts of the human body. Flater's explanation struck many as a bit hollow. Was there really academic value in instructors pointing at bones hanging on wire from the ceiling as a means of a pop quiz? The scholarly value of the room was not the only issue of debate, though. There were also questions about the exact provenance of the bones. How did Flater explain where the bones came from? We'll find out when Weird Darkness returns. You can stay up to date on everything Weird Darkness, read original paranormal articles by me, register for contests, and more by signing up for the email newsletter. You can sign up for the Weird Darkness newsletter for free at WeirdDarkness.com slash newsletter. Why 
while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. If you'd like to display your dark weirdness wherever you go, you can find Weird Darkness t-shirts, buttons, hoodies, office supplies, clothes for your kids, stickers, magnets, coffee mugs, and a whole lot more in the Weird Darkness store, with dozens of designs to choose from and a variety of colors to match your style. You can grab some weirdo merchandise for yourself or maybe as a gift for the weirdo in your life by clicking on Store at WeirdDarkness.com. When last we left, Flater's explanation for why he needed bones in the classroom struck Manny as a bit hollow. But there was a bigger question. Where exactly did those bones come from? Flater told reporters that they had been obtained several years before, when acquiring human remains was easier and had been lying around the college many packed away in boxes and of little use to anyone. No doubt the medical school had bones stored away, but whether they had quite so many was another matter. And one theory that made the rounds during the meeting of a local medical association involved the distasteful idea that the trio had stolen or otherwise obtained them from the Potter's Field or Pauper's Cemetery on Hart Island. For a long time, Hart Island has been New York's naughty secret. A mile-long island at the eastern end of the Bronx, Hart has served many functions throughout its history, including acting as a Civil War prison camp, a tuberculosis sanatorium, and a Shutter Island-style psychiatric hospital. But most notably, it has acted since the late 19th century as a dumping place for New York's impoverished dead and holds the distinction of being the world's largest pauper's cemetery, with over a million interments. The first burial was in 1869, and the volume eventually grew so high that the dead were placed in large mass graves, three layers deep, with a level of sod between each layer. Pits for children, for instance, were so vast that they held up to 1,000 burials. By the time the room at Flower Hospital was being decorated, there had already been 110,751 burials on heart, so there were potentially plenty of bones to be obtained there. Bodies were delivered to the island by a boat named the Fidelity, captained by Edward McAvoy, who had received several demerits for misconduct while in the Navy. He would sail the East River to pick up bodies from the city morgue and Harlem Hospital, among others, and twice weekly during the winter and three times a week during the summer drop them off on heart. The Fidelity could hold up to 100 corpses, which were covered over on the deck by tarps so that passing boats would not be able to see the grisly cargo. On the island, they were received by Superintendent of Burials John Bopp, who then processed them with a team of 50 convicts from Rikers Penitentiary. It was a nauseating spectacle and as a crew member from the Fidelity told a reporter in 1900, it's all the same after you're dead, but if you want to know the advantage of passing away among friends, take a trip to Hart's Island on burying day. It would have been scandalous to the hospital if it were to turn out that the trio had been obtaining bones from the graves on Hart Island for their project, but the suspicious past of Meyer and Nielsen meant that the question would not go away easily the pair had already come under media scrutiny in 1894, when the New York Times carried a story about how they were using narcotics to place stray dogs in Tacomas in order to experiment with a potassium solution as an antidote to morphine poisoning. Meyer at the time was known by his true first name of Oscar, although when he went into professional practice, he adopted instead his middle name of Northway. 
apparently in order to avoid confusion with the Oscar Mayer Wiener Company, which had been founded in 1883. At the time, neither of the two were even properly physicians, having yet to graduate medical school, and they instructed the paper to omit the title of doctor, since, as they described it, they were simply students with an inquisitive bent. They would administer morphine intravenously to the dogs until they fell into a coma, very quick for a small mongrel, up to four hours for a large dog, and follow that with a solution of permanangate of potash. The validity of their experiment was questionable, but at least none of the dogs died, or so they claimed. Not surprisingly, the weight of both public and private opinion was falling heavily against Meyer, Nielsen, and Flater. The latter was vehement in his insistence that not only was the display ethical, it wasn't even intended to be morbid. If the bones present a sight most gruesome, he argued, it is because of the nature of the subject and not because I had any idea of arranging such an effect. Despite the claims of the trio that the room was simply a means to put the remains of the dead to good and practical use, the hospital's governing board eventually mandated that not only would they cease adding to the display, they would remove what had already been constructed. Such a spectacle might be fine for the Catholic bone houses of 7th century Europe, but modern New York would not tolerate it. And with that, amid suspicions of grave robbing and professional misconduct, America lost its one and only attempt at a fantastic charnel house. Coming up, Kell's Irish Pub in Seattle has a creepy vibe to it, even if the displays and decorations inside aren't meant to be. Perhaps that's because the building started its life as a massive mortuary. And early one February morning in 1897, John Mars jumped out of bed from a sound sleep, and while the smell of breakfast cooking downstairs wafted up to the second level of the house, he inexplicably grabbed his pistol and went on a shooting spree of his own family. These stories are up next when Weird Darkness returns. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie, or So Bad It's Good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer, all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching and our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. If there is a definitive go-to Irish pub in Seattle, Washington, it's Kells in the Pike Place Market. Just about any local you ask, who doesn't live the teetotal life, has spent an after-work happy hour on its post-alley patio or a drunken St. Patrick's Day or two in this creaky, spooky, old-fashioned bottom-floor bar, perhaps partaking in the city's largest collection of single malt scotch. But not everyone who hangs out at Kells knows that there is a great reason why it is so creepy in there. Kells is in the ground floor of the Butterworth Building, as in E.R. Butterworth, who built Seattle's first mortuary inside this building and who basically invented the modern funeral as we know it. And the very words, mortuary and mortician for that matter, Kells occupies the former stables and funeral wagon garage. Half a block east from Kells, the Greco-Roman sandstone arches at 1921 First Avenue were, as Seattle Mets editor-in-chief James Ross Gardner wrote in 2012, a passageway of sorts from this life into the next. Beginning in 1903, 
when Butterworth & Sons moved into this snappy new building after bouncing around from the old Masonic Temple at 2nd and Pike to another location on 2nd and then another on 3rd, E.R. & Company had a monopoly on the death industry in Seattle. For the first few decades that followed, just about everyone who died in Seattle sailed through this building's archway. Many of the dead came through without names or identification. The era in which Seattle was settled saw epidemics of tuberculosis, diphtheria, and Spanish flu, likely among others, and without proper burial services available. The case before Butterworth & Sons, dead bodies would regularly just appear on the streets of downtown Seattle. It got so bad that the city started offering undertakers $50 per body that they could take off the streets as a community cleanup effort. Butterworth saw an opportunity and took it, and it would make him a very wealthy man. He hired John Graham, the English architect whose firm would later design the Space Needle, to plan out his grand five-story mortuary with a 200 mortar chapel, a crematorium, a columbarium for storing funeral urns, a casket showroom, and an elevator, the very first on the West Coast, used for transporting bodies up and down this marvelous palace of death. Butterworth had Graham draw up eight different blueprints before he presented one that was to Butterworth's liking. The building was done up in the Beaux-Arts style of the era, with four sculpted lion heads on the facade, facing First Avenue from three stories up. The aforementioned space that Kells now sits in held horses and hearses, concealed in the alley to hide the unsightly bodies from public view. The floors above were tricked out in mahogany, bronze and brass fixtures, elaborate stained glass and general Victorian filigree. The spacious chapel had pews of Flemish oak, a choir loft, and a newfangled system of light signals that a choir, should the family hire one, could follow to start or stop singing. Some of the services offered for Butterworth & Sons funeral packages were the transport of the body to the mortuary, washing the body, dressing the body, embalming, newspaper death notices, limousine and hearse service, casket with optional crushed silk interior, fresh flowers, burial permit, air-sealed vault, and musicians. There was nothing like it in the United States, Gardner said of Butterworth & Sons, maybe nothing like it in the world. Edgar Ray Butterworth never meant to work as an undertaker to begin with. Born in the Boston suburbs in 1847, he found himself working as a cattleman on the plains of Kansas when he encountered a grieving settler while traveling with his team. The man, whose wife and newborn child had both just died, had no lumber available for coffins on the prairie. Butterworth, it said, built a coffin for the guy with wood taken from his own wagon. Everyone in turn-of-the-century Seattle knew E.R., who also served in the state legislature, and his oldest son, Gilbert, respectively by E.R.'s signature long goatee and his son's high classic cheekbones and all-around good looks. They trusted the Butterworths with their family members who'd passed on. Although it is unclear whether folks did because they wanted to or because they didn't really have a choice. As for its modern-day incarnation as Kells, it has ghosts. Everyone who even vaguely follows that sort of thing will tell you this. The most cited one is a young girl of about eight years old with blonde or red hair. She supposedly shows up most when the traditional Irish music is going, appearing in the main room or on the stairs. Its less famous ghost is Sammy, who will show up in the mirror on the back wall. People say you'll see a man's face in the mirror looking right at you, but if you turn around to check him out, he vanishes. Turn back around to face the mirror, he's right there again, grinning at you. There are also ghosts that never show their faces, according to local legend. There is a small, ornate whiskey bar in the back corner of the restaurant, just a little corner bar that's easy to miss, but if you keep an eye on it, the candles all around the bar will allegedly light up on their own. Glasses are known to break on their own, 
silverware will levitate, and disembodied women's voices are heard. That same stairwell in the back, where the little red-haired girl hangs out, is supposedly home to lots of other spirits, too, who turn up in photographs via orbs. Or maybe it's just dust. Mercedes Caraba, who once ran the now defunct, uh, <coughs> full disclosure, Market Ghost Tours, told KUOW in 2009 that she spotted a pair of muddy, dirty hands pressed up in the windows of the First Avenue entrance to the building. The area is just kinda inarguably deathy, said Caraba, with a Duwamish burial site nearby and a 19th century settler's graveyard a block away. That said, this building hasn't been a mortuary or a funeral parlor for a really long time. In 1923, E.R. Butterworth moved his business to the western slope of Capitol Hill, at the northeast corner of Melrose Avenue and Pine Street. The new building was even more souped up and deluxe, with a crematorium and columbarium, fireproof vaults, an even bigger chapel and drawing rooms, purses equipped with Cadillac motor equipment with special designed bodies Pioneer historian Clarence Bagley wrote of it in 1929, in addition to funeral furnishings from the most simple to the magnificent. E.R. passed the business on to his sons, who passed it on to theirs, and it remained in the family until New Orleans-based chain Stewart Enterprises bought Butterworth Funeral Home in 1998, making it one of the longest operating family-owned businesses in Seattle history. The last Butterworth to run it was E.R.'s great-grandson, Bert Butterworth Jr., who was the one who sold it. Kells moved into the former livery in 1983, and not much of the grandiose Victorian interior of Butterworth & Sons remains there, or even inside the building's upper floors for that matter. Other than the bar, the building has been more or less empty, as long as anyone can remember, except for the ghosts, if you count those. Its deathy superstitions are still being kept alive by the building's current owners, though. Since 2005, the Butterworth block has been owned by the McAleese family, which also owns Kells, and the same year it was purchased, Karen McAleese saw something in the pub's kitchen that she still can't explain. He was a tall man who looked like he was part black with a suit jacket on, she reported to the Seattle Times. He had very thin hands he walked to the end of the bar and just kind of faded. Whether it's Halloween or St. Patrick's Day, if you're in Seattle and you feel like having an otherworldly experience, you just might want to spend it at an Irish pub and try your luck. Mrs. Emma Mars and her sister-in-law, Ida Mars, were preparing breakfast the morning of February 13, 1897, in their home at 129 South Upper Street, Lexington, Kentucky. Around 7.45, Mrs. Mars sent the servant girl upstairs with a bowl of warm water so her husband John could wash up. When she entered the room, John jumped out of bed with such a peculiar expression on his face that she quickly set the water down and hurried out of the room. She was halfway down the stairs when she heard a pistol shot from the bedroom. Mr. and Mrs. Mars and their two children, John Jr., age 5, and Helen, age 15, slept in two beds in the same room. John Mars Sr. had shot his son in the forehead as he lay in bed. The shot startled Helen awake. She saw what had happened and started screaming. John fired two shots at Helen. One missed her. The other went through her neck. Helen ran from the room as Emma and Ida approached the room. Running into her mother's arms, Helen cried, "'Oh, Mama! Papa has killed me! Don't go in there! He'll kill you!' Ida Mars entered the room just as John Mars smashed the head of his wounded son with the pistol. He turned the gun on his sister and fired. When the shot missed Ida, he threw the pistol at her head, knocking her to the ground. The boy was still crying in pain. Mars drew a straight razor and, with a wild, maniacal laugh, cut his son's throat from ear to ear. He then did the same 
to his own throat, severing his windpipe and jugular vein. Hearing the gunshots, neighbors forced open the door and rushed in. In the bedroom, now quiet, they found a gruesome scene. The young boy lay on the bed, shot, beaten, and slashed. John Mars lay on the floor in a sea of blood. In the hall, Helen was wounded and unconscious, Ida was in a state of shock, and Emma was suffering from nervous prostration. John Mars had a history of mental illness. At age 22, he was courting Emma Davis and asked for her hand in marriage. When she refused, he became infuriated and swore he would kill her if she did not marry him. Mars was judged insane and committed to the Eastern Kentucky Asylum. After six months, the doctors determined him cured and he was released. Emma then agreed to marry him and they settled into a happy marriage. John had a successful career with M. Kaufman and Company Clothiers and owned a great deal of real estate and interest in several building associations. He belonged to the Knights of Honor and the Odd Fellows and was a deacon at the Central Christian Church. Around Christmas, 1896, John was taken violently ill, having peculiar headaches. Since then, he had not been in his right mind. He was given to spells of melancholy during which he would discuss suicide. Dr. Joseph Bryan examined John and advised the family to commit him to the asylum again. The night before the murder, he said to his wife and sister, I'm not afraid to die, but I can't bear to leave you all. I want my children to go with me. Thinking he was joking, one of them responded, why, what are you going to do with your wife and sister? Oh, you must come too, he said. I want all of you. The Mars family was one of the oldest and most prominent families in Kentucky. The funeral for John Mars Sr. and John Mars Jr. on February 14th filled the Central Christian Church with 1,500 mourners and many more stood outside blocking the streets for blocks. Father and son were buried in the same grave. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please tell someone about it who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. If you missed any part of tonight's show or if you'd like to hear it again, you can subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast app by searching for Weird Darkness. By doing that, you'll get a copy of tonight's show plus daily podcast episodes that come out seven days per week. Visit WeirdDarkness.com and you can follow me on social media, drop me an email, send me your own true paranormal story, listen to other podcasts that I host, and more. All stories used tonight are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories or the authors in the show notes, which I've already posted at WeirdDarkness.com. The Lady Laughing in My Bedroom is by Jeff James from My Haunted Life 2. New York Charnel House was posted at Empire Delamort. The Beaux Arts Butterworth Building was by Meg Van Hygen for Seattle Curb Bed. The Act of a Madman was written by Robert Wilhelm for Murder by Gaslight. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. And a final thought. Value yourself and know your worth. You are as important as everyone on this earth. Every human being has a purpose. Your life has value. It is not worthless. You are beautiful and special. Be proud of who you are. Live your life to the fullest and reach for the stars. Harry Bridgman I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.
There have been monsters among us lurking in the darkest corners of America, preying on children since the first settlers arrived on our shores. They've always been with us, stalking the innocent from the days of the original colonies to the Gilded Age, the Depression, and beyond. These monsters are not the stuff of fiction. They are blood-curdlingly real, and they still walk among us, always looking for their next victim. In the chilling book Suffer the Children, Troy Taylor shines a light on the darkest tales of horror and hauntings from American history and presents a terrifying collection of dark crimes perpetrated against our most tender victims, our children. His most disturbing book yet includes nightmarish tales from the 19th century, when the good old days were never good, like The Monster of the North Wood, The Pocasset Horror, and The Girl in the Cellar, and continues into the modern day with accounts of The Cluxon Woods, America's first school massacre, Wineville chicken coop murders, Babes of Inglewood, Suzanne Degnan, The Girl Scout Camp Massacre, The Perfect Murder of Bobby Franks, and many more. Be warned, this is not a book for the faint of heart. These are tales containing brutal, agonizing, and terrifying scenes of horror. Suffer the Children, American Horrors, Homicides, and Hauntings, Dead Men Do Tell Tale Series Book 15 by Troy Taylor. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. In Washington, D.C., there are two walls that, from far enough away, appear to be black slabs. As you come closer, you start to notice the etchings on the walls. Closer still, and you will see that the etchings are names. In total, there are 58,308 names, each one belonging to an American man or woman who lost their life in the Vietnam War. Most of these lost souls return home to be buried, but far too many, some who died but were never found, others who were taken as POWs, etc., never came back. For the families of these missing 1,200 people, there is a hole that will never be filled, a hole created by uncertainty, by fear, by grief. To this day, there are mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, hoping for a miracle, hoping that their loved one will return, and with each passing year, the chances of that miracle happening shrinks. For the family of Master Sergeant John Hartley Robertson, that miracle happened in 2013, no matter what the world tells them. John Robertson was 32 when the helicopter he was in was shot down over Laos in May 1968. The copter carrying Robertson was never recovered, and in 1976, he and the other passengers were declared dead. In 1982, Robertson, along with his brothers-in-arms, had his name etched into the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall. He can be found on panel 64E, row 8. At the same time as the memorial was opened to the public, the U.S. government received reports that Robertson was alive. Robertson's wife and children weren't told. Tom Fonts never had an easy life. Born in Detroit, Fonts's father died when he was young, and while Fonts never liked to speak about it, his children believed that their grandfather perished in a house fire. After the death of his father, Fonts spent a life in and out of orphanages and detention centers suffering abuses he preferred to keep to himself. When the chance came, Fonts joined the U.S. Army and spent 27 months in Vietnam. His time in the military gave Fonts something he'd been missing – a family. After the war, Fonts became a born-again Christian and chose to live his life by a simple but honorable credo – radical love, no one left behind, no one left unloved. Fonts spent his life traveling the world on humanitarian missions, doing his best to ease the suffering of others. In 2008, Fonts was on a humanitarian mission in Vietnam 
when he heard about John Robertson, the American soldier who had been living in a small village. Fonts set out to the village to find Robertson. Robertson was old, and he had all but forgotten how to speak English. He sat with Fonts and explained what happened in May 1968. His copter was en route to a rescue mission when it was shot down over some mountains. Robertson survived the crash but was instantly taken captive by North Vietnamese soldiers. For four years, they kept Robertson caged up, beating and starving him. At first, they tortured Robertson in hopes of gaining information from him, but in time, the torture just became something to pass the time. When he saw his chance, Robertson escaped from his cage and ran. He evaded the soldiers that pursued him and broke out of the forest before collapsing into a field where he was found by a woman he would later marry and have four children with. For reasons unknown, Robertson never tried to contact his family in America. For over 40 years, John Hartley Robertson lived with his new wife and children under the name of his new wife's dead husband, Dang Tan Nuk. Fonts pushed Robertson, now in his 70s, for more information. He wasn't about to blindly trust the man, but he hoped, deep in his heart, that what he was being told was the truth. Robertson was clear on some details, but other things, like when he was born or the names of his American children, he couldn't remember. He was suffering from dementia and would often break down in tears. Fonts, with the help of Emmy-winning documentarian Michael Jorgensen, searched for more information on Robertson. They found that the U.S. government has been contacted by Robertson multiple times, but they never informed his family. Robertson first contacted the U.S. military in 2006 to tell them that he was alive. In the information he filled out, Robertson wrote down the name of a non-existent high school and the wrong address for his U.S. home. He also misspelled his own name. Robertson tried again in 2008, and this time he was taken to the U.S. Embassy in Phnom Penh where he was fingerprinted. His prints did not match the ones on file. As far as the U.S. government was concerned, this was another case of a Vietnamese man trying to trick the military into giving him the back pay that John Robertson would be owed. Tom Fonts wasn't so ready to call Robertson a liar, though. His belief is that the U.S. authorities are working to keep Robertson and other living U.S. MIA POWs in Vietnam silent, though the reason to do so is unclear. Fonts and Jorgensen took Robertson to Edmonton, Canada to meet his only living sister, Jean Robertson Holly. After a brief moment, Jean was sure the man standing before her was her brother back from the dead. Jorgensen turned the story into a documentary titled Undocumented in 2013. Shortly after the premiere, U.S. authorities released new information on Robertson. In 1991, former CIA paramilitary operations officer Billy Waugh traveled to Vietnam to find Robertson and obtain a DNA sample for testing. Waugh was successful, and the test proved that Robertson had not taken the name Dang Tang Nok from a dead man. He was Dang Tan Nok. How Dang Tan Nok, a Vietnamese citizen of French origin, had found the name of Master Sergeant John Hartley Robertson, or why he chose it, is unknown. What is known is that Dang Tang Nok is a well-known con man who has used the names of multiple dead soldiers to con veterans groups into giving him money. Wall believed that Nok had collected thousands of dollars over the year. Still, Master Sergeant Robertson's family held out hope. In November of 2013, they started a GoFundMe campaign in hopes to get the money needed to perform their own DNA test. While they were unable to reach the intended goal, the Robertson family was able to get the test done. The results showed that Wall had found over 20 years earlier, Dang Tan Nok was not John Hartley Robertson. Men like Dang Tan Nok, men who take advantage of the grieving and the hopeful, are true monsters who walk the earth every day. To lose a family member to a war can be nothing less than shattering to one's soul. To lose them again because of the actions of a con man is something no one should ever have to feel. The want to believe that your loved one is alive and well overtakes the rational side of your mind 
pushing out all doubts because in the end, all any of us want is a happy ending. To find out more about MIA or POWs that are still missing and to donate to those families who are still living with uncertainty about their loved one who fought in Vietnam, you can visit pow-miafamilies.org. That's pow-miafamilies.org. When Weird Darkness returns, a woman comes home to find her visiting sister murdered, and police are convinced she was the one who committed the crime. So why wasn't she locked up in prison? And a bordello, pizza, and a haunting. You can find them all at the Red Onion Saloon. These stories are up next. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Mrs. Ida Quinlan and her nine-year-old son Johnny went out to buy a pair of stockings around 9 o'clock the night of February 1, 1896, leaving her baby in the care of her sister, Mrs. Sophia Grant. They took a streetcar to the store, several miles away, purchased the stockings and other sundry items, returning to the house at around 11. Ida rang the bell, but there was no response, so she went to the landlord who lived nearby and got a key to the house. Entering the sitting room, she was surprised to see the drawers of the chiffoniers pulled out and the contents spread on the floor. She called for Sophia and, getting no response, went into the kitchen, where she found her sister lying dead on the floor, covered with blood. Horrified, Ida ran from the house to seek assistance from the neighbors. At least that was the story she told the police. The following day, Ida Quinlan was arrested for the murder of her own sister. They lived in a three-story tenement in the Charlestown section of Boston. It was a two-family home, but at the time Ida Quinlan and the two children shared the house with her sister Sophia Grant and their brother Angus McLeod, a conductor on the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad. They also took in lodgers. John Thompson, a brake man on the same line as Angus, had a room there. Sophia had married B.W. Grand three years earlier, but after a few months they decided that they did not want to live together. She stayed in Charlestown, and he lived in Providence, Rhode Island, where he had a dry goods business. It was said Sophia and her husband were on friendly terms and corresponded frequently. Dr. O'Brien examined the body for the police and determined Sophia Grand had been struck in the head several times with a blunt object fracturing her skull. She was wearing nothing but a nightdress and stockings, but had not been sexually assaulted. There were no signs of a struggle, but a rocking chair in the kitchen was overturned. She was probably struck while sitting in it. Robbery was thought to be the motive, but no one from the house could say that anything was missing. Ida thought Sophia kept $25 in one of the drawers, but that could not be confirmed. The doors had been locked when Ida returned and there were no signs of a forced entry. It could have been one of the residents of the house, but everyone with a latch key had an alibi. It might have been a former lodger who kept his key, or possibly the killer had climbed a drain pipe and entered through a broken window on the third floor. But the police did not think it was necessary 
to go so far afield. Ida Quinlan's story did not stand up to close scrutiny. The police had several reasons to suspect Ida of the murder. She had a record of violence having been charged with assault and battery three months earlier. Ida's husband David had moved out due to her bad temper and drinking habits. She was the last to see the murdered woman and the first to find her dead. She could not explain why she left the house after 9 o'clock and traveled so far to make a purchase that she could have made at a store near her home. It was unusual for her to keep her nine-year-old boy out past 11. After finding the body, she ran from the house without first checking on her baby. Their guard dog, a large black Newfoundland named Fred, gave no indication of being disturbed by an intruder. The police were convinced that Ida Quinlan was guilty and arrested her for the murder of her sister. Additional evidence was gathered. Dr. Wood of Harvard University, who did forensic analysis for the police, examined the dress Ida wore and found blood, not in blotches which might have resulted from touching the body after death, but small spots as if spattered. Her Macintosh, shirtwaist, and shoes also had spots of blood. Nine-year-old Johnny Quinlan, when questioned, said he'd been by his mother's side all night, but the police found witnesses who contradicted that. At nine o'clock, a delivery man came by with a dozen bottles of beer Ida had ordered. Normally, he would have carried them upstairs for her, but this time Ida carried them herself. While she was inside, William D. Daughtry, a tailor on his way to the shop, saw a boy standing alone on the street. He recognized him as Johnny Quinlan and said hello. Ida and Johnny had been seen apart long enough for her to have murdered Sophia. The biggest problem for the police was the absence of a motive for the murder. Relations between Ida and Sophia were cordial. There were no recent arguments or long-standing feuds between them. It was said that they disagreed on religious matters, but not enough to incur violence. Ida would not benefit financially by her sister's death. There appeared to be no reason for Ida to kill her sister. In spite of this, the police were ready to take their case to the grand jury. Without a motive, it was doubtful that Ida would be indicted for a first-degree murder, but the police were sure that she'd be charged with second-degree murder or at least manslaughter. But the grand jury was not impressed by the evidence against Ida Quinlan and did not return any indictment. While they vowed to keep investigating, the police were reluctant to pursue any other theory. They had gone all in against Ida Quinlan, and they still believed she was guilty. Their reputation as officers rests on their claim, said the Boston Daily Advertiser, and it could not be said that they would attempt to pass over any other clue, yet it can easily be seen that it would be very hard for them to get up much enthusiasm in working over something that would be a slap in their own faces. The Boston police found no more evidence against Ida Quinlan or anyone else in the case. The murder, which made sensational headlines in February, was all but forgotten in March. In the small city of Skagway, Alaska, on Broadway Street, there was a building built with planks cut by the town's founder, Captain William Moore, this building is interesting for three reasons – a bit of naughty history, pizza, and a haunting. The naughty history of the building began just after its completion when it opened as a bordello in 1898 called the Red Onion Saloon. This was during the gold rush when miners hoping to hit it big traveled through Skagway, which had been dubbed the Gateway to the Klondike on their way to find gold nuggets. Miners would come in looking for entertainment in both drink and ladies, and they found both in the Red Onion Saloon. The first floor was a saloon where the men would imbibe alcohol and dance with the women. The second floor contained ten rooms where the men were entertained by the ladies who inhabited them. Choosing the ladies was done with dolls. Each had a doll that represented them behind the bar. If the dolls were sitting up, the lady that the doll represented was available. If the doll was lying on their back, they were entertaining. 
As time passed and the rush for gold faded from the area, the bordello eventually faded as well, leaving the building behind to become other things. It was used as barracks in World War II to house soldiers. It also became a union hall, bakery, and gift shop, as well as a laundry and television station. But its history as a bordello would not fade, and it was destined to become a saloon again. Only this time, there would be pizza. Today, it is a historical landmark and operates as a saloon and brothel-themed pizzeria with pizzas with bordello-themed names like the Busty LaRue or Lady Lavoie, and the employees dress as madams from the Red Onion Saloon's heyday, as well as barmen and musicians in period dress from that time. It's also a working museum where they give tours and you can view items that were once in the brothel. Sounds like a fun place to visit, even without a ghost. The haunting itself is allegedly the ghost of a woman who had been named Lydia and is thought to have been a prostitute at the Red Onion Saloon during the Gold Rush. There have been multiple sightings of her, especially in the upstairs area. Though she has been allegedly hostile to men, she does have a fondness for plants in the saloon and waters them. There have been footsteps heard on the second floor, and if that doesn't frighten you, she also has appeared as a full-bodied apparition that ran down the hall when police came to check out a disturbance. She then ran into the madam's room. When they checked it, no one was in the room. It is often this room where her spirit is seen walking around and watering plants that are no longer there. There is often a strong smell of perfume and cold spots. Unfortunately, it's not known whether she died in the Red Onion Saloon, but one of the former madams was believed to be named Lydia, and perhaps it is her spirit that lingers. So if you want to do some ghost hunting on your own, the Red Onion Saloon operates from April to October. Get a drink, order a pizza, and if you're lucky, you'll also get to see Lydia. Sudden death over time. Weird dark